So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our Graphs Lab student, faculty, and industry seminar series. Today, I'm very glad to introduce our first speaker from industry this semester, Matthew Pickley, who is also a Penn alumni. So uh, he finished his bachelor, master, and PhD degree at Penn in mechanical engineering and minors in computer science and robotics. During his undergrad, he was the electric, uh, electrical lead of the school's Formula SAE race car team, and he also earned the pilot license. So he continued his work under the guidance of Professor Martin uh, in Mode Lab for his master's and doctoral degrees. It was during this time that Matt created the world's smallest self-powered flying vehicle named uh, Piccolo Shimo as well as began work on the motor controllers that laid the foundation for his startup, IQ Motion Control. So today he's going to talk about his research journey as well as his life after Penn. Without further ado, please let me hand it over to Matt. Thank you. Uh, that was both an excellent summary of my life and this talk. So uh, you already know what I'm gonna talk about at this point. Um, just so you know, I've got a couple monitors going on, so this is my presentation. So I'm looking at you, but I'm not looking at you. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm just going to dive right into it because uh, that was perfect. So uh, my talk is about trading complexities. Uh, so going in between mechanical and electrical realm uh, and figuring out how we can make trade-offs in one side versus the other. Um, so for example, uh, drones are very common. So this is a quad rotor that everybody has come to know in recent years. Uh, this is actually a very old one from 3DR. Um, but the way this works is there's an IMU in, in the flight controller. And that IMU is estimating the direction of gravity somewhere between a hundred and a couple thousand times per second. And then when the vehicle tilts, the direction of gravity tilts relative to the vehicle, or I guess really the vehicle tilts relative to the direction of gravity, and the IMU notices this, and the flight controller, oh, wrong way there, the flight controller adjusts the um, motor commands to increase and decrease the thrust so that the vehicle will try to roll itself back. Uh, one thing that also happens in this vehicle, which I'll touch on later, is when it's tilted sideways, it will also scooch to the side. So uh, this type of active stabilization with the IMU, it hasn't always been around. Uh, flying vehicles are older than this type of IMU, although uh, gyroscopes were around at the same time. Um, so these early helicopters, they didn't have IMUs and closed loop feedback for um, you know, electronic clo closed loop feedback. So how did they stay in the air? Um, and for these particularly old helicopters, the answer is they didn't. They kind of hovered and, and came back down rather quickly. Um, but they laid down the foundation for good research in kind of the 1930s, 1940s um, into making vehicles that look like helicopters that we know today. Um, and so here's some toys that uh, exhibit the same type of stability properties. So um, this vehicle here has paddles and these are aerodynamic surfaces that mix in blade pitch um, with aerodynamic forces from, from spinning around. Um, this one has a fly bar, so this uses inertial forces and mixes in changes in blade pitch to stabilize the vehicle. This one's a little interesting. So this one uses dihedral. So if you look at all of these motors, they're angled inwards. And if the vehicle rotates to the side, like it is kind of pictured here, um, the motor that's closest to the bottom is now aiming the most vertical. And that one is fighting gravity the most. Meanwhile, the one that's highest is more horizontal facing and is not facing gravity. So the difference between this vertical facing one and the center of mass makes a torque, which attempts to rotate the vehicle back to its original orientation. And if you look at a normal airplane, uh, most airplanes have their wings tilted upwards with the hedral, and that's exactly the same property. So 
whenever you uh, get to go on an airplane again, um, take a look out the window and notice that the wingtips are a lot higher than uh, the root, and now you know why. So I'm going to talk about vehicles that particularly have a different type of stability. Um, and this one is a little less common. So it's a combination of gyroscopic forces and differential lift. So differential lift is when uh, one blade sees a little extra wind than the other blade. So if this vehicle, which spins continuously, there's no part of this vehicle that doesn't spin. So the whole thing is spinning around uh, continuously. And then if the vehicle moves this way, there's some extra wind this way. And so this blade sees a little extra wind, which gives it a little extra lift. And that makes the vehicle try to rotate. But this is a big gyroscope. It's a uh, spinning mass, so it has a lot of angular momentum. And to conserve angular momentum, the vehicle will actually start pitching 90 degrees from the direction of that torque. Um, so this is a whole lot of kind of mechanical engineering going on here, and that's at this point in the talk, the point. So um, we're, we're looking at all of these devices which use mechanical tricks to um, achieve a task which nowadays is achieved electronically with an IMU. So at first we were, we're talking about stability, and we really need to define stability to, um, to talk about it. So uh, there are four different types of stability that I'll be discussing today. Um, the first one is angular rate stability. So essentially, does the vehicle drive its rotational rates to zero? Um, so does it want to prevent roll and prevent pitch? For people who fly quad rotors or other RC vehicles, this is known as rate mode uh, or acro mode. Uh, the next type of stability is attitude stability. So it wants, to it wants to drive the rates to zero, but it also wants to drive the angles of the vehicle to zero. So quad rotor will hover nicely when it's nice and flat, and uh, you need to drive the angles to zero to be flat. So that is normal attitude control, and if you just pick up a random quad rotor, uh, that's probably what mode you're flying in. The next one is velocity um, stability. So driving your X and Y velocities to zero, as well as uh, driving your rates and angles to zero. Um, this is not a very common method of stability that you'll see because it, it only gets you kind of halfway there. So it's better than attitude stability, but it's not really what you want in the end. Um, this vehicle that I built is a vehicle that exhibits velocity stability, um, and we'll, we'll touch on that later. And then finally, there's position stability. So if you kind of pull this drone away from where it's supposed to be, it will try to get its way back. Uh, normally, this is done with GPS um, in this particular uh, drone, which was built by Frank Shen, who is a PhD student in VJ's lab. Um, you know, it uses stereo cameras to, to figure out its position in the world. So like I said, most of my vehicles are uh, velocity stable. Um, so we're not really going to care about the X and Y positions very much, but we'll care about the X and Y velocities. All right, so these are some of the vehicles that I built during my PhD that all exhibit velocity stability. Uh, on the left, you see a quad rotor. Now, unlike a normal quad rotor, it's not using its IMU and changing the velocities of the motors. Uh, at, in this vehicle, all four motors get the exact same command. And the design of these plastic film plates are really what determines stability. And if anyone has ever flown kites, you might recognize this shape as a, a box kite. Um, and box kites are designed exactly with this type of stability in mind because otherwise they'll spin around and just come tumbling down. Uh, these vehicles are um, also velocity stable vehicles and they use uh, the differential lift and gyroscopic forces to uh, stabilize themselves. So both of these have a high speed spinning surface um, and in this vehicle, that's this uh, wood propeller here. And then they have uh, an opposite direction, lower speed um, spinning surface. And so that's these drag plates 
um, here, here. And then in this vehicle, we kind of flip-flopped which thing is, is making the differential lift and the angular momentum. So it's, it's not this propeller here, it's actually um, these big plates that are doing the differential lift and the angular momentum. Um, but fundamentally, they're the same principles and they also both fly. So uh, like I said, with that um, little toy in the second or third slide, you know, all surfaces in these vehicles are spinning. Um, and here we have the, the propeller that's spinning in one direction and the drag plates spinning in the opposite direction. On this one, you know, there's really just two sets of propellers, but they're very asymmetric. Um, but again, everything here is spinning. So why are we taking this rather elegant um, uh, electronic design and kind of going backwards into this super complicated mechanical design? I, I, I did forget to actually mention what this example is. So I'm sorry that I'm showing you these pictures and not really showing you. So this is a pocket watch. And this is a, a quartz uh, clock. So there's a little crystal oscillator. I think that's this chip. And a crystal oscillator, it's really good at keeping time. Um, it, it uses a very small amount of energy. Meanwhile, you know, this uh, pocket watch uses springs and, and it's not very accurate. Um, so clearly most people, if you have a wristwatch, it operates off of quartz. Even this little smartwatch that I'm wearing here is, is essentially a, a quartz watch. Um, yeah, so why did we go from this rather elegant design? So in the quadverter world, that's an IMU, um, over to this mechanical design. Well, the short answer is I'm old. And when I started my PhD, IMUs were about $150 and for kind of not great ones as well. Um, by 2013, when uh, you know, my PhD was what I wished was halfway done, um, IMUs had come down in cost to about $5. And they were so easy to get at that point that you can even see one on this quad rotor. So this hardware was used both for making actual quad rotors and this passive quad rotor, but this passive quad rotor never actually used its IMU, but it was already so cheap that it had one anyway. And actually, so does this vehicle. It had an IMU on it, but it never used it. And the reason why these became so cheap is because of the auto-rotate feature on smartphones. So smartphones were pretty new, and uh, the auto-rotate feature was something that needed to be supported, and it needed to be supported cheaply. So that's why IMUs and drones these days are so cheap. All right, so now that my PhD was already obsolete halfway through it, uh, I kind of had to decide what to do with myself for the rest of my PhD. Uh, and so we're, we're now about to take two diverging paths. One of them is to make the same vehicles that I've been making, but just make them smaller. Make them so much smaller that there's um, really no way that you could build a vehicle that uses an IMU and has actuators that can react to that IMU. That's the only way that this um, is still a useful design. Um, so I'm going to talk about that first, um, and then I'll, I'll talk about the other fork later. So uh, if you look at these two vehicles, uh, they're almost identical. Uh, they have a main propeller, uh, that's the green one here, and the white one here. They have these lifting bodies um, that are connected to the higher uh, moment of inertia part of the vehicle. So this is the gyroscopic and differential lift part of the vehicle. Same thing here. Uh, we did make some improvements. So we took this battery and we were smart about it. We said, hey, this is some mass. Let's put that mass on the outside of the vehicle increase our moment of inertia, which will therefore increase our angular momentum and make us more stable. We also uh, got better at weight balancing. So we were able to remove these little weights uh, just to make the vehicle simpler and more elegant. Uh, and now just for scale, this is kind of how big this vehicle is relative to this vehicle. And this was only about a, a little more than a foot, maybe a foot and a half across. And so you can imagine this is, uh, Pretty small, about the size of a quarter. In fact. 
So uh, how simple is this? Like how, the, the reason why we could make it so small is because it's just so simple. We don't need a lot of stuff on it. So this list that we have here is the entire bill of materials for this flying vehicle. We have a switch to turn it on and off, a capacitor uh, just to kind of smooth out the voltage, uh, a resistor to turn off the motor when there's no signal, an IR photo transistor, which uh, turns on the MOSFET, which turns on the motor. Uh, we have the MOSFET itself. We have three one cell uh, kind of smartwatch batteries. Uh, they're all in parallel. We have a pager motor, which was actually pulled from a toy quad rotor. And we also have the propeller that came from that toy quad rotor. We have a 3D printed frame, which was printed at Penn on the ProJet. And we have some wire, super glue, and solder. That's it. Um, and so really the, the complex part of this vehicle isn't the vehicle, it was the design of the vehicle. So how do you, uh, you know, make the shapes that make the vehicle actually work? And then once you figure out the shapes, you could just injection mold this thing for pennies. And uh, this could be a super, super cheap vehicle. But of course, uh, it's not real until you see it fly. So this is a slow motion video that, um, yeah, that shows the vehicle flying. The thing I'm holding in my hand is essentially a infrared flashlight. So it, it PWMs the, uh, the light at a low enough speed where it essentially directly PWMs the motor using that photo transistor and then connected to the MOSFET. So you can see the vehicle slowly spinning up. It's gaining its angular momentum as the, the little white main propeller spins. It makes a torque that makes the vehicle spin in the opposite direction. And once it's generating enough lift, it takes off and uh, it flies. And there's no, there's no magic in that handle. Some people think there's magnets or something like that. There's, there's none of that stuff. It's literally just uh, three LEDs sticking out the bottom or something like that. All right, so uh, you saw the, the simple version. Um, maybe we can make it a little more complicated. So the simple version, it can only go up and down. It has no way of steering itself. So we're gonna try to make this version be able to steer. So we have almost all of the same components, uh, you know, propeller, motor, the three batteries. Uh, we have this tiny circuit board. Uh, we added a TV remote sensor. So essentially, we're using that TV remote sensor. We're saying volume up, volume up, volume down, volume down. And that's what controls the throttle on the vehicle. We also have a sideways facing uh, IR photo transistor, uh, which is trying to figure out what, it, what is north, what is forwards. And so the, the vehicle needs to know which direction to go when you tell it to go in a direction. Um, so it's using that photo transistor. That photo transistor is spinning around. And every time it sees a blip of infrared light, locks onto that and it says, okay, that is forwards. So normally that would be something like if you had a window um, and there's sunlight outside, that's a big source of infrared light. And then that, that would be your, your bearing, that would be your heading. Um, we actually made this uh, giant cactus looking thing that just had infrared lights shooting out of it. And, um, and then we did all the tests in a dark room so that we can uh, do some nice image analysis. So I'm going to talk about that image analysis real quick. Um, so we put this little red LED on the vehicle. And as the vehicle spins, if it's hovering, it kind of PWMs the motor like this. Um, and so this LED is hooked directly to the motor. And then as it's, and let me pause this real quick. As we're trying to turn, uh, what will happen is the motor will be on for you know, three quarters of the time, something like that, and then off for the rest of the time. That'll make a whole bunch of lift in this portion. And then when we turn off the motor, the motor speed will slow down and um, the, it'll make less lift. But you have to remember that this vehicle is spinning continuously. So um, in this image, when the light, when the LED is over here, the motor is also over here. You just kind of have to integrate the, um, the motion uh, and, and the forces to get kind of the average forces and torques. So this is a still frame of the video that we analyze. And you can see the red ring here is the LED. Uh, there's also an LED in the middle, just so we can kind of get our bearings. And then 
Whoop. That's wrong. Sorry about that. So, um, there we go. So at this location, the, mo the vehicle has spun all the way around. It's, it's powered its, um, its motor. And so this is the fastest that the propeller is going. And then the motor gets shut off. And so this is the slowest that the motor is going. And then it increases speed. Now, there is this weird little gap here. And we'll talk about this gap. Um, this is aliasing of the shutter speed. So the vehicle is spinning at about 42 hertz, and the shutter is going at 60 hertz. So you only get to see partial rotation of the vehicle in any one frame. And we know that this is the aliasing part, and this is the steering part, because frame to frame, the, uh, the aliasing moves. Meanwhile, the uh, pulsing location doesn't move. I hope that made sense. Maybe this will clear it up a little bit. So these are videos from actual flight. The green dots are when it's essentially hovering. You know, you can see it kind of gets blown around by wind currents in the, in the room. But then when we start pulsing, which is the red segment, it clearly changes its direction. Uh, and then the yellow dots afterwards indicate the uh, resulting velocity. Um, and if you watch these videos long enough, they, the, vid the vehicle actually starts to slow itself down and comes to a stop, indicating that it does have uh, velocity stability that we um, were talking about earlier in the talk. So if you look really closely, in particular this one, you can see that there's a, there's a gap right there in the LED. Just one more time. So you see that gap right there. Um, and so pretty much every time it turns, it kind of turns away from that gap. So you can see the gap is on the right side in this video. The gap should be on the left side in this video. Yep. So, um, so we, we showed that we can actually get this vehicle to steer. But not only that, um, you know, I, I didn't get my PhD in making things. I got my PhD in making things and proving that they work for the reasons that I think they work. Uh, so uh, we wrote this very nice nonlinear simulator that could estimate a number of parameters for the vehicle, but um, in particular, its motion, its motion profile. So this is, um, the simulator is the dotted line and the actual track is the, um, you know, what we pulled from the video is the green line, uh, or the green and red silent lines. And this is when the steering started, this is when the steering ended. And uh, you can see the the simulator tracks it pretty well. I'm quite happy. So this is, you know, you're accumulating integration error. So the longer on you go, the worse it's going to get. But um, we did pretty well with this. All right. So how does Piccolissimo actually compare? Um, Piccolissimo is uh, it's only two and a half grams for the small version, and it's four and a half grams for the large version. Interestingly, the large version that can steer, it, it actually has about a gram of payload too. So you could put something like um, you know, a small camera or uh, some, some gas sensors or something like that on there. Um, I, and these are the quad rotors that we pulled the motors out of. So interestingly, anytime someone builds a smaller quad rotor, we can take one motor and one propeller out of that quad rotor and stick it in a Piccolissimo design and essentially have it be half the size. Um, and we're talking about top down uh, maximum dimension size. So since we're talking about size, uh, how does it compare to other kind of record setters? So that's what we have down here. Here's mini Piccolissimo, maneuverable Piccolissimo. This is the Harvard Robobee, and this is the Stanford Mesicopter. So the Mesicopter was a, a late 90s quad rotor was really ahead of its time almost kind of to a fault um, because they didn't, you know, lithium polymer batteries weren't really uh, a thing then. And uh, so this thing never actually flew under its own power, but it did show that it could generate lift with these super tiny propellers. Um, and, you know, the, the mesicopter wound up being 39 millimeters in diameter, which is exactly the same size as uh, maneuverable Piccolissimo except the difference is maneuverable Piccolissimo is now able to uh, carry its own batteries. 
uh, kind of the same argument with the RoboBee. Uh, so the RoboBee is this really cool um, kind of piezo actuated ornithopter. Um, so it flaps its wings and it flies. And um, the wingspan on the smallest version of this is 35 millimeters, at least the last time I checked. Um, so the RoboBee has maneuverable Piccolissimo beat by a couple millimeters, but Mini Piccolissimo uh, has a beat by, by a little bit. Um, but another thing to note is the RoboB is also tethered. Um, they have made some kind of fake solar powered versions. Uh, I mean, it's not fake, it of course worked, um, but you kind of have to shine a high power laser on it to make it fly. Um, so it's not carrying around batteries like a normal flying vehicle. And so that's why uh, when we talk about the, the Guinness World Record that we set, we always have to say something like it's the smallest self-powered flying robot because uh, if it's not self-powered, then RoboB has this beat. Um, not, not mini Piccolissimo though, mini Piccolissimo smaller, but it doesn't turn. Um, okay, so with that, you know, Piccolissimo definitely a success. Um, this is me and Mark uh, holding up our prized piece of paper. All right, so uh, earlier I said, you know, we were diverging paths. One way we can go is make the vehicles a lot smaller. The other way we can go is uh, actually do what normal people do, which is trade mechanical complexity for electrical complexity. So we're going to do that. We're going to go in the direction that most people go, um, which is, you know, get these nice quartz watches. Um, but instead of doing it with watches, we're going to do it with brushless motors. So to understand how we improved a brushless motor, you have to know how a brushed motor works. So this is a brushed motor. It's super cheap, uh, super easy to use. You essentially just connect a voltage to two wires that go into the motor. And as the motor spins, so this, um, you know, this whole chunk here is, uh, pretending to be a motor's rotor. Uh, so in this picture, that's this portion here. Um, so as it spins, these brushes contact the different parts of the commutator. And, and that way, the, oh, let me bring up these things. So this is the commutator in the real motor. Oh, that's this part here. This is the permanent magnet, uh, which is this, big south and north part of this diagram. These are the windings. So that's this uh, coil that's right here. And these two are the brushes. So these brushes, this, I mean, this whole cap kind of goes on the bottom of this motor and these brushes contact this commutator. So as the rotor spins around, these brushes you know, contact this copper plate, but then it contacts this copper plate, um, so on and so forth. So that's how the, um, the magnetic field generated by the coils spins around with the rotor itself. So you, you have to keep them together because if you, if you don't spin the magnetic field inside the rotor, the motor won't spin, it'll just lock in place. So uh, this is the inside of a brushless motor, but there's no commutator. Uh, so where is it? How, how does the magnetic field in these coils spin around? as this rotor spins around? And the answer is, there are some electronics that do it. There's uh, an electronic speed controller, what most people call an ESC. Um, and that ESC is deciding which voltages to apply to these three lines, which are connected to the three different phases of the motor. Um, and it has to decide this very quickly, uh, many thousands of times per second. So we made our own, um, especially in the early 2010s. We didn't have any ESCs available to us that would do the things that we wanted them to do. So we, we started making our own. And of course, we were in the mod lab. So we had to turn them into modules. And we put a, uh, a snap lock, a, a quick lock uh, mechanism that allowed us to attach these in different ways to different mechanisms. So this is our brushless motor module. Um, as we moved on, uh, we started making more and more dedicated flying vehicles. And so this is a, an all-in-one motor controller, uh, flight controller with radio and all that. Um, but essentially the same thing. 
Um, and you can also see a battery is integrated into there, into both of these as well. And then later on, uh, and I have to point this out, this one was done by James Paulos, also known as Jimmy, who is now a postdoc in VJ's lab. Um, and Jimmy and I worked very closely together and his fingerprints are all over everything. And I wish you all have the pleasure of working with him. He's a super smart guy. Um, so this, this iteration of the motor controller was done by him. Um, and it was actually a little bit before 2017, but he published his paper in, about it in 2017. Well, not about it, about his research, which is different, and I'll talk about that later. Um, I do not want to take that phone call. So, um, you know, we're, the way that we uh, took the complexity out of the motor, so uh, we, we instead put a position sensor inside of our uh, inside of our motor controllers, inside of our ESCs. So normally the position sensing is done by the brushes in the motor, uh, but now we're doing it with this position sensor and the position sensor informs the ESC about which voltages to apply when. Uh, okay, so we've already shifted the complexity from mechanical to electrical. We've taken out the brushes from these motors and that actually reduces a bunch of friction and it's much more efficient. Um, but are there any other mechanical complexities that we can, that we can get rid of? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's cogging torque in all of these motors. And cogging torque is a big problem. So here's a little video that tries to explain what cogging torque is. So this is the inside of a motor. We're going to get rid of the windings here. So cogging torque is when the permanent magnets of the rotor interact and grab on to the iron, which is in the stator core. Um, so it's only a torque ripple, it's always there no matter what the speed is, and it's only detectable by mechanical sensors. So other types of, of motor problems of torque ripple are detectable with current sensors, but this is the only one that current sensors can't see. So uh, because we have a mechanical position sensor, uh, we are in a unique position to neutralize this using software instead. But first, you have to understand what people did in the mechanical realm. So this is what a normal motor looks like. Um, this is an FEA simulation, but you can see that in, in the normal motor, um, it's essentially straight down. So there are, there are windings that are usually wrapped around these teeth. And this is a nice simple one with straight stator stack. Uh, one thing that people do is they skew the stator stack so that it kind of blurs the, um, the magnet's attraction to the iron core. And you know that, that works quite well in making uh, cogless motors, but it also reduces the torque of the motor significantly. So you're sacrificing motor performance. And it's also harder to manufacture these. Um, this one uh, is another method that people have used, which is changing the, the tooth design. Uh, and then there's another one, which is um, essentially making the magnets angled instead of the uh, stator angle. So there are a whole bunch of mechanical tricks that people have tried to get rid of cogging torque. Um, but what we did was we used our position sensor, we put the motor in position control and just told it to hold its position everywhere along the, the rotation. And this is the voltages that it had to apply to make sure that that worked. This method looks at accelerations of the motor. So a torque will cause the motor to accelerate. And if we can detect accelerations, we can find the cogs. Interestingly, um, let me pause this real quick. So this uh, third blue line here is also a force torque sensor. So we laid on top uh, all three of these map making methods, the position method, so using the position control, the acceleration method, where we're you know, taking the second derivative of our position sensor, and then uh, what the force torque sensor spat out at us. So in normal motors, you can't use that force torque sensor because it's you know, $5,000 and you can't put $5,000 on every single motor. Um, but uh, it doesn't really matter because all three of these methods really line up with each other nicely. So all we have to do with this map that we make um, from one of the three different methods is we just invert the map and have it feed forward in, into the motor control. Um, and that will essentially eliminate the cogging torque of the motor electronically. And that's kind of the whole point here. So uh, this plot is uh, the torque ripple ratio of the motor, which is kind of a metric that I made up. Um, 
So it's the peak to peak torque ripple divided by the maximum continuous torque ripple. And you can think of this as what percentage of the motor's torque do you need to overcome the cogs? And so this motor here, 12% of the motor's torque is just fighting cogs. Um, so uh, the x-axis here is price. So how much does the motor cost? And you can see that cheap motors have really bad time with cogging torque. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the motors uh, time is just spent fighting cogs. Meanwhile, more expensive motors, this is a nice Maxon motor. Um, they, they're very good at getting rid of this mechanically. But if we put our anti-cogging algorithm on there, uh, you can see it kind of levels the playing field. So the good get better and the bad get almost as better. Um, so between two and 4% is what we got in most of this. So essentially what we can do is now take a super cheap motor and apply anti-cogging and have it run a lot like a very expensive motor. So you could save a ton of cost here. I'm going to run this. Uh, so this is a two link robotic arm. Uh, it's direct drive with really big links. So any error kind of gets amplified. Um, no gearbox, you know, because it's direct drive. And what we're doing here is we're, we're running it twice. Um, we're running it once normal and once with our anti-cogging algorithm turned on. And this is just a, you know, PID position with a trajectory. Um, and so you can see the difference between the green and the blue. The green kind of, it, it really didn't follow the trajectory very well. Meanwhile, the blue follows the trajectory much better. Uh, here it is again. And the only difference here is whether we turn this feed forward anti-cogging term on or off. Same gain, same motors, same everything else. And we don't have to watch the rest of this. Uh, of course, we need some numbers here. So um, the anti-cog root mean squared error was a little less than half of the uh, nominal um, motor. So uh, significant improvement in position control without even changing the position control. All we did was feed forward anti Uh But then the question arises, why wasn't it perfect? Why, why didn't we make that uh, zero, uh, the RMSE zero? So we started digging into all the different things that make anti-cogging work um, and all the different sources of torque ripple we noticed one of them in particular, which is the PWM resolution was very coarse. And so this red line here is showing the minimum change in torque that we're actually able to command with our uh, speed controller. And you can see pretty much all of these, these are all different motors. All of these different motors can only be anti cog down to about one or two of those increments. Um, so the, the easy way to fix that is to just have more increments in your PWM. Um, your resolution is now doubled. And so your peak to peak torque ripple gets virtually halved. Um, there are actually a whole bunch of different things that you can optimize to make your, um, your anti-cogging algorithm work better. And we looked into that. Uh, ultimately, all you need to know is um, the red is our predicted, and the black is what we measured. And uh, this is normal, and this is with anti-cogging turned on. And we could predict fairly accurately the different things that you have to tune um, to, to make anti-cogging pretty good. All right, so I'm back to Jimmy here, uh, James Pollos. Uh, this propeller that he used is, uh, you know, it, that this is his research, his PhD work. Um, but he had this brilliant idea of instead of anti-cogging the motor, what happens if you just, if you, if you essentially make one big cog? Um, so as the motor spins, this, this is almost the same thing as the motor map that I was showing you a couple slides ago. Um, so as the motor spins, if you increase the torque and then decrease the torque once per rotation, and you do it always in the same spot, you can do some fun mechanical tricks uh, on, a, on a propeller that looks like this. So Jimmy essentially did reverse anti-cogging. He made a giant cog. Um, and then when he has this propeller hooked up to it, uh, this propeller has two hinges on it, which couple lead and lag of the blade with blade pitch. 
and you can inflict lead and lag on this blade by accelerating and decelerating the motor. And uh, you can see the mechanism actually working here. This is some really cool stop photography that he did. Um, but you can see the blade is now leading forward, lagging back, and clearly it's changing its blade path. And all it has to do is change the phase of this artificial cog as it spins. All right, so here it is again, lead and lag. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, back to the research here, and I'm gonna try to rush through this because I'm starting to run out of time. Um, what happens if you take Jimmy's propeller and my passively stabilized motor, uh, my passively stabilized vehicle, and you mush them together, uh, you get this pink foam thing, which is just an iteration of this, as well as Jimmy's propeller, which is right here. Uh, we call this UNO, so it's the under-actuated, naturally stabilized, one actuator uh, flying vehicle. And uh, I, I hear Mark has reused that name for other things, and that makes me sad. But uh, this never actually got published, even though it was my favorite vehicle. So um, I'm going to talk to you about it now and hope that its legacy lives on. This is the original UNO. Everybody remember that. Um, yeah, so the first thing we did was we, we used that nonlinear um, uh, simulator that I very briefly talked about earlier in the talk um, to optimize the parameters of this, um, of this blade. Um, so, you know, before you can see is a very rudimentary airfoil that we used and here we, uh, we optimized the crap out of it. So uh, how we did that was we used uh, we, we simulated a whole bunch of different parameters of the vehicle as it was flying. So this example here is the inflow of the motor versus the span of the blade. So inflow is when a propeller is spinning, it's moving air through it. And the inflow velocity is how fast that air is moving through that disc. And since the blade is the thing that's making the inflow, um, you know, you can compute how fast that air is moving. Um, using the simulator. Uh, and so this is the results of using a bunch of different simulated uh, propellers. Uh, so this, those would be placed right here. So you can see this really tiny prop has a really high inflow, but not for very far along the span. Um, and that's because this propeller is so much smaller than this vehicle. Uh, meanwhile, the longer propellers, they have a much smoother, more uniform inflow that goes out longer. All right, so once we have the inflow, now we can change a whole bunch of parameters in the vehicle um, to optimize it for stability or, uh, or other parameters like efficiency. Um, so here we were changing the angle of attack of the blades and um, subsequently we're going to try to figure out the stability of that but you have to know the inflow. So that's what this very sharp edge right here is. Uh, this is the change in inflow from using uh, something like a, a 10 inch blade. Okay, so how do we do the stability analysis? First, we tell the vehicle to hover uh, in the nonlinear simula simulator, and then we kind of give it a shove. And when we give it a shove uh, in, in different directions, we measure the, ex the resulting accelerations of the vehicle uh, in the simulator. And we, you know, the acceleration is the slope of this, and we fill that into a Jacobian matrix, and that gives us essentially a linear model of our very nonlinear system. And in these plots, you can see there's there are two sets of lines. One of them is the nonlinear line, and one of them is the linear line. So we essentially reran the simulation um, with the nonlinear simulator, and then with the linear simulator and got almost the same results. So you know that the linear simulator is doing a pretty good job at predicting the vehicle. Um, but once we have this Jacobian matrix, we can find the eigenvalues and do a stability analysis. So for anyone that is taking controls, this is a root locus plot, and this tells you a lot about the, the vehicle stability. All right, so was it actually stable? Let's get to the fun part. Um, oh. I hope this video runs for you. It seems like it's not running. Um, maybe this time. Yeah, so this is Jimmy and he's uh, batting the vehicle with wind and you can see that it's flying stably. It uh, returns to its original position. So there's a little bit of actual hover stability here. It's more like an integrator control, so it's not perfect, but um, ah, 
I'm sorry this video is not working out very well. So here's Erica, she's gonna hit the vehicle again. And of course this video also is not working very well. Um, but the vehicle does come back to its original position and continues to hover. Ah, shoot, I hope this doesn't happen with all the rest of the videos. And of course it does. So uh, here's Jimmy, uh, he's trying to fly the vehicle here and I, yeah, I hope, uh... anyway, this is the first time that we actually got the vehicle to steer. So uh, you can see Jimmy, he's trying to fly and I'm standing there in the background celebrating that it actually steered. Um, and sorry that the videos aren't working. All right, um, well, once I got, really once I got Piccolissimo working is when I was able to graduate, but um, again, you know, this, this is actually my favorite vehicle, don't tell anyone. Um, but after I graduated, I started a company. Um, you know, I realized that the, the hardest part of my research was actually having the hardware that I needed to do the research. And so I started a company that set out essentially continuing this work of, of making better motor modules for everybody to use. Um, so just as this evolution happened in our company, um, we continued to evolve further. So this is our very first uh, prototype. We started machining it out of aluminum uh, and integrating the controllers more and more into the motors. And we finally got to the point, this is kind of a prototype of our first production motor. Um, you know, the, you can see the, the controller is very tightly integrated and it's a nice sexy package, but the whole controller is, is inside there. Um, so now this is our kind of first flagship product. We've sold thousands of these um, and they're still for sale, although I think they're back ordered at the very moment. Um, so these are uh, drone motors, but they also work quite well in robotics applications. Um, our first big customer is Flyability. They're a, uh, a Swiss drone manufacturer. They're actually spin out of EPFL and uh, for their Elios 2 drone, so their second version drone, which is this one, they needed our motors. Our motors were the only motors that could, um, that, that could do the things they needed to do. And well, I'll just let them explain it. Maybe, I don't know if the audio is gonna work. I have no idea if you can hear the audio, but at least you can watch. Right, so they have this rigid cage around their drone and anytime the drone bumps into something, um, there are moments that are applied to the whole drone. And so the drone has to fight those moments. And so in order to do, in order to do that, they have to change the thrust of their propellers very quickly to reject those moments. And um, that means they have to reverse the direction of the motors if you want to make negative thrust. And so to do a full, uh, do a full moment on it. And uh, our motors are the only ones that can cross over zero quickly. We also do a whole bunch of closed loop control, you know, just normal PID stuff that just for some unknown reason, nobody else does. So we also have much faster reaction times. Um, so last week, uh, we actually just launched a brand new version. This is a larger motor module. Um, it's essentially the same thing. We added CAN bus to it, but it's really just more, more power. Um, and so it's, it's not just for drones, although of course it works quite well on drones, um, but it also works in uh, robotics applications. So this is a two link arm or leg uh, that we hooked a, a pen up to. You can see it has nice kind of smooth motion. Uh, so this isn't a stepper motor. Uh, this is a, a servo motor. It only draws power when you need to. You can use it as virtual springs. Uh, and it's also super easy to talk to over Python, MATLAB, C++, Arduino, um, and we have a, a GUI that you can use as well. We've also continued work on the underactuated propeller since our motors are the only production motors that support this. Uh, we've started making our own version um, and it works very similar to uh, what Jimmy has. Um, so in the same way, it couples lead lag with blade pitch uh, and I'll just quickly get to our video of it. So uh, you, if you remember Jimmy's video of the propeller pulsing around, this is exactly the same thing. 
Um, so you, it's doing circles and you can see it changing its thrust vector as it's spinning. My last final note is uh, we raised some funding money in, uh, at the end of 2019 and we're looking to spend it. So we're hiring. Um, we're looking for embedded engineers and electrical engineers at the moment. But um, yeah, if, you, if you're interested and you think you're good, <laughs> uh, send me an email. And with that, I'm done. So I'll hand it off. Thank you. <clears throat> it was a great talk. So uh, you've got uh, some questions in the Q&A panel. You want to uh, look? Yeah, uh, so pick, uh, Matt, um, your first question uh, from Wembo Zhang, does your PhD degree help you uh, to run your startup? And, and what are the pros and cons associated with that? Yeah. Um, whew. So uh, yes, uh, the PhD is, is the foundation of our entire startup. Um, it's, it's a great way to, to do the early research um, that's necessary. So when you have a company, the, the product that you sell, it has to be useful. It has to um, go in the hands of customers and it has to work. And nobody ever gets it right the first time. So the time that I spent doing my PhD you know, I spent years trying to figure out how to make it reliable enough that I could then sell it a couple of years later. Um, the PhD also helps a lot. Um, you know, you have to manage other people. And uh, as a PhD student, you frequently have to manage, uh, you know, master students, undergrads, maybe even high schoolers. Um, and it, it teaches you management skills. And finally, it helps you learn, think critically about everything. Um, you know, it's, there's one, one thing you can do when you're at work is just kind of do the jobs that are laid in front of you. But then the next step of that is figuring out what are the steps that have to be done. And that's kind of what managers do. And as a PhD student, you really have to do that type of planning also. Great. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the next, que next question. Thank you again, Matt, for, for this talk. Uh, every time I, I hear you talk about your stuff, I always learn something new. So uh, it was a pleasure to listen to this one. This one's related, again, to, to industry experience, uh, which I think is great because this is for, for graduate students at Penn trying to decide whether they should do academia or not. So you talked a little bit about this, but maybe if you could highlight, again, uh, some other skills that you gained through through academia. Um, one thing that I... I would like you to maybe talk about related to this is you did some extracurriculars while you were you're here. I know you you were always more than glad to to help out uh, other PhDs in lab, but also high school students. Um, so maybe if you can talk about if that had any effect on on your experience and and you as a roboticist. Yeah, of course. Um... Yeah, so, you know, I, 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 as you said, I did talk a little bit about this before, um, but it's, it, it's kind of, at the high level, it's all managing people. Um, so you learn how to interact with people, um, and there are many ways you can do it. Um, and, you know, you'll, everybody has their own style. Um, and, <clears throat> yeah, it's... Um, is definitely a skill that you need to learn. Um, you know, I've, I've been trying to be friendly and that's, that alone is a hard skill, especially if you're kind of naturally grumpy like I am. Um, and, and that's something that really helps. Um, but yeah, doing a PhD lets you learn those skills without those skills being the focus. You know, the, the focus of your work is to learn, is to, um, uh, is more, more internal skills, like being able to figure out the problem and solve the problem on your own without too much, um, without too much help um, and, and identifying what is the next problem. That's, that's really the focus of the PhD, but then there are a whole bunch of skills that you learn outside of that, which, um, you know, managing people. Um, and because you're not in this um, kind of scary environment where you, 
you know, your boss is watching you and all that. Um, I mean, maybe your professor is watching you as a PhD student, but you do get to um, leave leave the uh, the task at hand. So, you know, I took a bunch of courses. I just audited courses because, you know, towards the end of my PhD, I, you know, there are all these courses I didn't take. They weren't going to be worth anything, but I still wanted to learn them. And, um, you know, it was, it was great being able to do that. Um, I was involved with the formula team well after uh, my undergrad. And, you know, I just found that fun. It's, you know, I like cars. What can I say? Um, so yeah, the, the PhD program gives you a safe umbrella to really expand yourself um, without having all the pressures of being in the workforce and being a real person. Uh, so I guess another question from um, another uh, attendee. Did you ever consider pursuing an academic career? Um, and what factors uh, led you to pursue industry over academia? Yeah, um, definitely. I definitely wanted to be a professor or, um, you know, I'm maybe a lecturer, maybe a professor. I mean, it, it was always on the table for sure. Um, I think in the end, I, I like to get my hands dirty just a little bit too much. Um, and I, I didn't want to, um, you know, kind of uh, worry more about the math and behind the scenes. And, um, oh, shoot, I even had a, a hidden slide about this, sort of. Uh, maybe I can pull that up. Um, I don't know if I'm still here. Um, can you see my screen, my, uh, my presentation? No, nope. not Bummer. yet. All right. Well, so uh, there's like technology readiness level. Um, it's it's something that kind of you know DARPA and, and all these other groups use, um, and it's it's um, a metric of how far along a particular technology is, and I think I'm happiness the happiest where it's further along but not yet mainstream. So um, working in the lab is where I'm happiest. I'm not really um, one to go over the basic principles. I don't, I don't really want to be the one deep, deep, deep in the math. And that's just my personal preference where I found myself. And so doing a startup where we're working on something new um, and it's, it's definitely still research, but it's the research right before a product, um, that, that seemed to work out quite well for me. We have another question here, maybe a, a little bit of a quicker response. What was the best class you took or audited? Were there any non-technical courses you would suggest? And I might also ask you to extend that to your undergrad in case in case you don't have any non-technical courses in your graduate. Yeah, um, all of my grad courses were very technical. Um, undergrad, I have to say, I really liked sociology. And part of that was because it helped me understand people and as a, as a nerd, you know, people are hard, uh, robots are easy. So uh, it, it really helped me understand how people think and how the world around you works. Um, so it, you know, allowed me to pop my head up. Um, and yeah, I mean, so a lot of my research is, is based on control theory and advanced dynamics. Um, so those were by far the two most influential on my on my research and um but but you know every, every course helps every project helps and you know they all had together in the end so there's no one particular favorite um, i think i think we have uh one last question here before probably it's time to wrap up um sure. <clears throat> what was the biggest challenge you faced during your phd graduating uh, yeah, just um, making making the story complete um, and in as as in depth as it had to be to make it to the next stage of my life. Um, you know, you you have to make sure it's all there. You can't do a bunch of million little projects. Uh, you have to go into depth into things and show that you can actually do some of that depth. 
Great. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So uh, thank you uh, guys for attending uh, this week's seminar. So next week we'll have another uh, internal speaker, Oli, uh, also from Penn. So see you next week. Bye.